Hello, this is the Anfield Wrap with me, Gareth Roberts. Um, it's a free show with a difference this week. Uh, we thought we'd get into how a transfer works, really. I mean, there's a lot of talk at, at the moment about, you know, why things take so long, what it's like, you know, why, why, why do negotiations take as long as they do? You know, why can't why can't clubs just sort of meet in the middle over valuations, all that kind of thing. And so, rather than so, just sort of speculating away, we thought uh, we'd ask some people who are a bit closer to transfers than we are. So first up, first off, we've got Paul Joyce. Uh, I'm sure you all know is the Liverpool uh, reporter for the Times, the Merseyside Patch reporter. Uh, Joyce is going to tell us about uh, what it's like covering the Reds and and getting into transfer stories and everything else. Uh, after Paul, we've got uh, Neil Sang who is a football agent. He's followed by Stephen Warner, who I'm sure you all know. And then last of all, we've got Oliver Hunt from Onside Law to give us a lawyer's perspective on, on that side of thing of a transfer. So as I say, something a little bit different this week. Hopefully you enjoy it. If you do, please share it. Please shout up. Let us know on social media, all the usual stuff. Here we go then. Here's Paul Joyce. Okay, so the idea behind the, jo- the show, really, Paul, is, is sort of... Looking at transfers from people who've got people who are involved, if you like. So, you know, what for you when you when you look at the way people talk about transfers on social media, on forums, in real life, you know, what 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 things you think people are perhaps don't appreciate and you you would know through dealing with, you know, agents, players, clubs and all the rest of it. Is there something is the stuff that goes on that you think, well, that's just not realistic? Like you know, people will say, "Well, why think? Why don't things just get done in a day or a couple of hours?" Or yeah, I think that it's it's the process that that we will go through before we 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 publish a story that 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 maybe is worth talking about. Um, obviously, you see on social media now, there's probably 10, 15 names a day that Liverpool are linked to, mm. um, and so I think it's still important for for today's newspapers, probably even more so for today's newspapers to, to have a credibility that when they run a story, it's, it's perceived to be correct. So obviously we're, we're speaking to people all all the time. It's not just, you know, a case of phoning up up the club and asking them to, you know, for an update on what's going on. I know there's maybe that perception is out there, but I'd say that's wrong in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, I, I've been covering Liverpool now for for uh, twenty years. So in that time, people come and go and move on, but you've still got some people you would speak to and um, in and around the club, not just in positions at the club. Now um, there's agents that you speak to sort of every day, trying to find out what you know what's going on. Um, so it's not just a case of phoning the club up and getting a name off them. There's you hear you hear a lot of things, and it's 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 necessary to to go and check those out. And that's mm. when you you probably approach the club because you don't want you know to be writing something that that's not proved to be to be accurate. That's still the the sort of by, what's weird that that a lot of the journalists on this patch have really. Um, so I would say that more cautious than anything, mm. when, when a name comes up, you, 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 you go through a lot of sort of processes to make sure that when the story is finally written, that that, that, that is correct. I mean, I was going to say to you, you know, you, you, you'll know yourself that you've got, you've, you know, you've done 20 years on the patch, as you say, you've got a reputation and, you know, everyone sort of makes a bit of a, a laugh out of it on social media that are waiting for you to say something like that said every night. But I mean, with that in mind, I guess you've got to work out, you know, when something is a story and when it isn't. So, you know, there'll be a variety of people, there'll be a variety of conversations going on and you've, you've almost got to work out why you're being told what you're being told, haven't you? I mean, because yeah, I, guess- I, th- I think so. I mean, it's like, it, you know, there's lots of instances where you hit you hear things from people who, you have a relationship with and and that you will that you will trust in a lot of ways but you then have to go away and try and check that again really just to you know double source it um as you said there is i think there's that pressure it's not just on me it's on a you know tony be when he was doing it and you know chris bascom dom king there's a there's there's that pressure on 
on that we feel, and, and it's a pressure that you want, that you want your your stuff to be, Melissa's another one, you know, that you want your stuff to have a credibility with it. And so, you know, it, it's not just about putting the first name that's out there. Because, mm. And that, I think in this day and age now, I think that's maybe where you have to differentiate yourself because you'll see yourselves on the amount of names that come out on social yeah. media. Um, and if Liverpool signed every player they were linked with, you know, there'd be hundreds each window coming in. So I think that's the role of that we have in, in transfers, as you said, then to sort of differentiate between what is right and what is wrong in them. I mean, sort of, you know, being, being close to the process, if you like, so speaking to agents and players and the clubs and stuff, you know, is there is there is there something there that I mean, I guess what I'm getting to is I, I'll see, for instance, that people will, will post on the Anfield app and they'll say, "Look, you know, we know Liverpool want this player. We know this player seemingly wants to come. We, we've had a couple of instances of this this summer. You know, why can't the club speak and reach the, an obvious agreement? Why even on you know Salah, it seems to it seems to get done with the player and then be a long drawn out process before actually Liverpool could say. We've done it. We've announced the deal, and you know you reported last night that you know Naby Keita's uh, agree, yeah, think, agreed in principle a deal, and yet there's nothing seemingly being done between the two clubs. Yeah, I think in this in, in that instance, um, it's another way of how sort of the way of reporting transfers has changed. In both those instances, the information is coming from outside the country. So in the case of Salah. I think there was, you know, in Liverpool's interest had been trailed along with a number of other players for, for that position. But the first um the first reporting of any bid for, for Salah had come out in uh, Italy. Um and so that's another way that, that as well as sort of people linked to the club and agents, you speak more to journalists from abroad now and that and that and one of the things that social media done is, has opened that up so yeah. you can get in touch with people a lot easier so for example sake today over cater which was a report that came out from um a guinea journalist you know which which automatically has authority to it i mean there's some stories as we said before that are out on, on social media that you you think or in newspapers that you think that's nah, not quite right. But as soon as the information that um, was out yesterday on Cater has a ring of authenticity to it straight away because of just because of that link between the journalist and the player. Um, so I think what you've got, to, sometimes you've got a situation where Liverpool are trying to keep everything in house. And so there's, but they can't control it breaking in other, in other countries in this case. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of this information on Salah was coming from Italy because Liverpool were being understandably sort of cautious until a deal was done. They know it's a big summer for them. I don't actually think they've been saying an awful lot really. And so, you know, it was Italian reporters, Egyptian reporters, uh, in the case of Salah, where the information was coming on and that coming out from, and then Liverpool, uh, you know, maybe a bit more more forthcoming as the transfer pro prolongs. But I think in the case of Salah, one it was something like three weeks from the original bid coming out in Italy, the twenty eight million pound bid, to just under three weeks to the deal actually being done, which yeah. isn't, you know. You know, isn't a lifetime really? It's you know, it's still it's still quite quite quick business. Obviously, Cater um, now is the one everybody's talking to. Um, I think that you know, over the past weeks, the past week, there's been a lot of reports coming out in in Germany for that one, and as well, and obviously Guinea yesterday. So transfers, when people say, you know, it's the club giving the information out. In a, in a lot of ways, the club are trying to stop information coming out at this point, but can't, don't have control over, you know, Kater speaking to a journalist that he knows and that journalist then putting that out and, and German 
media speaking to their clubs and putting stories out there as well. I mean, it's just the way media has gone as well, and and the way culture has gone, and social media and everything else. It make it, it's got to be nigh on impossible now to 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 keep absolutely everything under wraps, hasn't it? I mean, you know, mentioning Salah again, we had his agents. So yeah. throwing up that, you know, he's on a flight to London yeah. and things like that. And, you know, it's it's quite easy to sort of join the dots between Instagrams and tweets and Facebook posts and all the rest of it. And, 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 and you know, Liverpool, as you say, can't control the message then, can they? Yeah, I think it's it's changed massively from when, you know, when I first started, you would be in at Melwood every single day uh, to have a press conference with the manager every single day. Be milling around the car park where the players parked the cars and as the, the players came out, you'd just stop and speak to the players. There'd be no sort of, there wasn't a press officer then. So you, 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 you were your own, the players were their own press regulators. If they wanted to stop and speak to you, they would do. If they didn't, they'd just say not today. Um, so it's just changed so much. And as you said, the sort of, the join the dots, Sometimes it leads to six, but sometimes it's right, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, there's one this morning, isn't it? Because Red Bull have launched a new kit without Cater on it. Yeah. Everybody naturally, you know, sees a conspiracy in that. Or oh, that means Cater's not, not co- is, is coming to Liverpool. And in the same way that I think Mbappe was promoted the new Monaco kit. So everybody means that, that, that he's staying type of thing. So... You know, the, you know, it has changed so much and it it's become, I don't think, I mean, are there any real exclusives anymore? I mean, there's probably, you know, you can probably always trace the name coming out somewhere first before it comes out. And I think as well, Liverpool are, are shopping in that elite sort of bracket now where, everybody's sort of heard of the players as well. Mm. And so there isn't the sort of left field sort of signing that nobody sort of, you know, that, that nobody's heard of. You just, you know, as soon as, you know, two, three months ago when Cater was, it started getting strong on Cater, everybody's got like the the YouTube clips of him out and stuff like that. And so there's no real, you know, an exclusive lasts for, you know, one minute now and then it's taken on by all different websites and everybody else so in the old days you, you know you you'd hear something at 12 o'clock and just keep your fingers crossed that that it wouldn't break and you'd file it for the morning paper and those days are gone now yeah every time you hear something there's that fear that if you don't put it out straight away that um that you'll get scooped in a way and on on the times um, the reason why certain stories come out at a certain time is because there's different editions. So there's a 12 edition, 5 edition, and at 9 a.m. in the morning, 12 and 5. So that's why, the, you know, there's that sort of uniformity sometimes each day that things come out at those times. Yeah. It's not because the clubs said put this out at five o'clock. It's because if if you don't put it out at those times in the day, then you won't get it. Then you won't be able to get it out. For example, if something breaks at half past six, you I then have to wait till till twelve o'clock at night for that to be published. So it's in my interest for it to go out at certain times in the day. So that uniformity that sometimes people perceive as a brief isn't in fact isn't that way in 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 effect it's just what's best for my newspaper at that time yeah do you think as well with with, with the culture of 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 football media now and every, everything's a story and you know he you know say wind back sort of 10 20 years and i don't i don't think some of the lines that sort of end up out there now would, would have been even considered then i mean certainly you know a club isn't interested in an x well i mean i've worked with you know, editors who used to say, "Well, that that's not a story." Then, yeah. But but now it is, isn't it? Everything's a story, and I, and I wonder whether it's actually making it more difficult for clubs. And what I mean by this, I mean I was one of the first to slaughter them, so I'm, perhaps I'm being a bit two faced. But you know, I think footy makes us all a bit two faced at times. But yeah. 
on on Van Dijk, um, you know the club the, the club's being slaughtered by fans for for the way that went for for Southampton feeling they'd done something wrong and the tapping up and the apology and the statements on the website and blah 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 blah, and yet the actual method of what Liverpool did in many respects is not out the ordinary, is it? In no, no, Liverpool Liverpool didn't do anything in from what we're led to believe that that most other clubs wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can still, I, I don't know what to say on Van Dijk really. I mean, obviously what I was explaining before about the certain times each day, that contributed to why the information, you know, the stories came out at a time or my story came out at a certain time. But in that, listen, I don't want to go into too much detail, but in that instance, I know where I got the information from and I'm happy that it was, that I, that it was sourced independently. Um, we'll see what happens with Van Dyke, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think Liverpool in terms of, you know the approach to the player. I don't think they did. They did anything that that Arsenal haven't done with Lacazette, for example. Mm. Um, and it's gone on forever as well. Yeah, hasn't it? yeah. I mean, and it's, and it, it's it's in, it's in players' autobiographies. It's it's not yeah, it's not exactly. like a it's not a twenty seventeen thing. It's no, gone on forever. No, and it's interesting that you know the Premier League decided not to take any action, mm. isn't it? Because if it was a if they were really worried about it, you would have thought they would have made a made a stand on that. I wanted to ask you about uh, agents as well, Paul. I mean, obviously you deal with with, with a lot of them and I think uh, in general, you don't have a good reputation and yet I think it's worth saying and, and the same applies to journalists that, you know, the, the modus operandi, if you like, of, of of the different people involved, both journalists and agents um, and players and clubs and blah, blah, blah. Everyone's different. There, there isn't, the, you know, so if we say, oh, well, all agents are in it because all they want is, you know, the money and they, they just want, you know, the best for them. They want a cut of it and blah, 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 blah. That doesn't apply to all of them, does it? No, and not, no, and not all of them use, you know, dodgy tactics or upset players or upset clubs. There's, there's different standards for different people, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, that catch all, catch all phrase of agents being, you know, bad for the game, you know, it's totally, totally flawed in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, there's, there are a lot of agents who who look after the players and protect the players out there, and and the perception that they're just in it for the for the money sort of be, betrays the sort of the investment that they've made in because a lot of times these players have have had. The, the agents have had the players from from the age of sort of, well now you're getting down to sort of ten, twelve. Yeah. So there's no there's no, you know there isn't a big a big money tree there at the age of ten or eleven. So it's the investment that that they put in, and you know, I think you're having Neil Sang on yeah. on the show, who to my mind, would be a good example of somebody who invests a lot of time in a player like, for example, say Tom Davis at Everton. Um, probably speaks to him every single day, advises him on all parts of his, of his life, keeps him grounded. Um, so, though, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, put him in a bracket with, with maybe other agents who, and I think he will have like a personal touch with Tom that that will almost make him part of the family type of thing. So, you know, maybe some of the bigger agents have have um, you know a more unscrupulous, but even then, you know, ultimately. The player, it's for the player to say whether he wants something or not. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think there was an interesting one over the weekend with the link between Ruben Neves and, and Wolves and everybody's having a go at Jorge Mendes because obviously he's linked with with um, Fosun who own, who own Wolves now. But, I mean, surely the player has a, 
responsibility if he doesn't want to go to Wolves to say, I'm not going there. He can't force forcibly, I don't know, maybe I'm being naive, <laughs> but I mean, you know, you can't, I don't think you can just pin it all on the agents. The players have, have a responsibility as well to, you know, to say what they want in their careers. I, I don't know of too many players who who have been moved on because the agents thinks that's good for them. Ultimately, it, it's their yeah. decision. Ultimately, yeah. it's their decision. Yeah, I think that's what I'm saying. Um, do you feel as well that, you know, the, the media at all is it, 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 kind of used at times? And what I mean by that is, I mean, if we, if we look at, say, the Oxlade Chamberlain situation, you know, Liverpool linked over and over and over with them. It's been like, you know, it, that's that's another one that's turned, it felt like it's turned into a saga. And yet, the, at the same time, over to the left, we've got a situation with this contract and Arsenal and all that. And so, you know, if you're being a cynic and you're looking at it, you're saying, well, is all of this, is all this Liverpool interest, he, he's interested in going there, all this sort of long love story between Klopp and him. And, and yet you wouldn't be surprised if he just goes and signs another contract at Arsenal. And then you're looking at it thinking, well, is everyone just being used a bit here, that Liverpool, journalists, etc.? Yeah, I think that I think that's very perceptive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, you know, that is an increasing part of it. Um, Sergio Ramos and Man United a couple of years ago that was everybody felt at the time that was designed to get him a new contract at, at Real Madrid um, and I, I think that's the hard part now because if you don't play that game to an extent oh sorry it's, it's, it's difficult not it's difficult to say I'm not going to have any part of that Mm. And I'm not going to do that because why is because there's people who will do that. So why is that agent going to speak to you if you're if you're not prepared to? And and that's very difficult to have to have been been doing the job for so long. And gradually, because of the power uh, and the money that's in in the Premier League now, and the and the the growth of agents. So when you when you when I started, certainly the the be maybe two or three agents that that you deal with, but because you were seeing the players face to face, you could speak to them about things. Yeah. Now we're now we're in Melwood before a press conference, um, so you don't have that contact. So consequently, you have to go to other people. Consequently. You know, there will be times when you feel um, what you described. Then, really, that the, 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 there's a certain games games are being played, and you know you don't want to get dragged in into those. But at the same time, as you sort of said, like I mean, if, for instance, if if Liverpool are linked with a big a big name and there does seem to be something in it, even if you question the motives, if you're like, if, you're like, if you don't write it, but everyone else does, then your desk's going to be saying to you, well, I, I, you see where, why haven't you filed this? Yeah, and that, that's where you've got to be strong and say, well, my, I don't believe that, that that's, I don't believe that that's the, that there's a strong enough interest at that moment to, to, to warrant a story on it. And listen, you know, you can be you can be too cautious sometimes. Yeah. Um and there's the evidence of that this year with me. I've probably been too cautious on on some stories. Um but but my mind is that I'd prefer to to get it right and know and know that it's definitely right than as we said before, just go with every name that's out there and say there's some something in that. I mean, if you take take one example recently, is the sort of interest in Mbappe, Mbappe, which everybody says, says straight away. Oh there, was, oh, there was comments on that. That's FSG PR. Yeah. Well, to my mind, what benefit is a? It's a. That's not true. And, and it goes again to the story coming out in France again. So it goes against this idea that that, that it was briefed. It was out in Le Keep about uh, the weekend. It came out in Le Keep 
the weekend after the first salad bid. So the, the Thursday was the salad bid broke. And then on the Sunday, there's a story in Le Keep that Klopp had, <laughs> had met Mbapp's entourage. And, yeah. you know, maybe he needs to be a bit more under the radar and when he's meeting everybody and all that. But um, so that story came out then. And straight away, I think it was you said it on one of the podcasts, why would Liverpool not ask for for that player? Why would they not want to be involved in the conversation? So then obviously the story came out on the night Salah signed about in Marcus said Liverpool had had a hundred million pound bid turned, a uh, hundred million euro bid turned down. So from our point of view, I don't think Liverpool would bid for a player unless they know 100% that the player is going to come. And how they get that information is just football nowadays, yeah. what we go back to say. But that, but your gut feeling says that, and sometimes your gut feeling can be as good a judge as anything, is, is that there is an interest in Mbappé. And I know people say, well, it'll never happen and, and it's FSGPR, but... That's just not true. Well, the PR thing doesn't doesn't work for no. me because I, you know, as you, you know, because what, what, what have they been slagged off for? They've been <laughs> slagged off for going for players and not getting them. Yeah. So why are they gonna? And if this is another out? one, if, if this is another one they don't get, then they don't benefit out no, of that. Everyone no, just says, no... well, they, they can't, they haven't done it again. Yeah, they've not done it again. The club's not not an attractive proposition for the elite. So I think it's it's sort of dissecting what's right and what's not right. And a lot of the time there is, you know, the marker story about the hundred million pound hundred million hundred euro million pound bid obviously was too much had gone too far. But the genesis of the story that Liverpool at the time there's a lot of talk about Arsenal um feel that they can get Mbappe if he comes to England. So you know, if you're Liverpool, why would you not say, well, we're more attractive than Arsenal at the moment. We've got Champions League football. Yeah. Klopp's a better, more progressive manager than Wenger. Um, so why would you not sort of be in the conversation? Exactly. Uh, on, on transfers as well, where, where would you put it, Paul, in terms of, you know, the bits of the job you enjoy, if you like. So, you know, it's quite, it's actually quite varied what you do, isn't it? So you, so you do a match report, you might do match previews, you might interview players, you might interview managers, you do the press conferences before and after. You know, they're, they're all different types of journalism. Yeah. And, and so is reporting on transfers, isn't it? Yeah, I think the transfer phase is still the sort of most, it's the hardest part of it. Because obviously when you go to the match, you're just reporting on what you see. Yeah. Transfers, you're sort of chasing stuff. And so it's the hardest part, but it's also, if you do get something, it's it's probably the most enjoyable part of it as well. It's just that nowadays that doesn't last very long because yeah. there's, that, the, there's the panic of, can you use it? And you have to get it out because the fear is that it's going to come out in... Germany, for example. I mean, I, I would imagine the next the next step in the in the cater situation will probably come out of Germany because the journalists will be today speaking to Red Bull. Um, their journalists know the agent better than the j journalists over here. So, um, so yeah, the transfers is the most sort of reward in part because of the job in a way because you feel that you're informing sort of supporters something that they don't know whereas the sort of um press conferences and the, and the match reports you know everybody sees that yeah. side of it now but it's definitely got harder to, to try and get the information that uh and to get that information first has, has undoubtedly got harder over the years and and only will will continue to get harder because it comes it can come out in so many different um areas now and i think the advert the rise of sort of club media as well means that the clubs increasingly want to break the stories themselves mm. um because because of hits and, and everything else. So 
I, I don't think it's going to get any easier. I mean, and it, it also makes it harder for you as well, Paul, that you've got all, you know, you, you've got all kinds of Twitter accounts, you've got all kinds of websites and, you know, they, they won't be striving to the to the standards you set for yourself. So, I mean, for instance, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus here. I'm, I'm sure everyone's got their own different ones. But, you know, for instance, I'll look on, like, News Now, for instance, at the, at the, the list of Liverpool stories. And there's, the, there's websites on there that are always top of the list every day in terms of what hits they must be getting. And it's it's nonsense. A lot of it. It's and it's it's headlines that you know really. I I don't like the phrase clickbait because I think it's a, a bit of a ridiculous phrase in a way. But if if you're talking about clickbait, well, these are the closest lads to it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. look who Liverpool are in for now type of thing, and it's every day. And it's like, well, yeah. The, the, I think that's going to end up being counterproductive though, because mm. you know you're saying before about the sort of the the, the half ten everybody waits to see what's coming out at half 10. And, and just to explain that, that that's because the back pages of the, of the newspapers are sent to um, the BBC and, and the BBC will put, will put the back pages of the, the paper out by certain um, of their reporters. You can follow them on Twitter. So mm-hmm. you will see the back page of every paper at half, na- ha- at, sorry, at half 10. And so that's where the half ten thing came from. To sort of, why would you? Why would you? Why would you lose ownership of that story? Um, because the B, because everybody can see it at half ten anyway on the BBC's tweets. Um, but I think that that whole sort of, you know, Liverpool, you know, uh, remarkable transfer raid and and all that <laughs> that 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 you probably see 10 times a day, I think that that will come back to, I think there'll always be that sort of thirst, thirst for the truth and the, and the credibility in stories. And I think that, you know, it's papers, isn't it, as well do it nowadays. And um, yeah, I just think people, people are, I think supporters are too savvy now for all that. And I think they'll, they'll see through They'll see through that, and they'll they'll know that if it appears on X X website, X newspaper website, or X website, it's it, it's increasingly likely that it's not going to be right. Yeah, I think I think I think because right. the treatment because if they do get something right, the treatment of that story in the headline is different to if they're just taking a flyer. Do you know what I mean? So if you know if for example, say. You know, there's a story and Andrew Robertson is going to sign today or something. The, the paper that the paper that will do the do a flyer type story on Sergio Aguero sign or whatever will treat that story differently to Andrew Robertson because they know that one's true. Mm. So they even package them different. So they're not really kidding anybody in the in the long run. I just think there'll be a I and you, and you sort of hope there is you you hope there is a turn off from from that and that you know it's weird that, isn't it because I think there is and there isn't that there is in terms of there's plenty of people who will just say well unless Joycey Dom blah 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 are reporting it I, I don't really believe it because the lads on the patch seem to have a, a higher standard but at the same time the likes of your gossip column on the BBC the likes of like, I mean, I used to work at the Mirror online and, you know, they do like a Liverpool roundup, an Arsenal roundup, a Man United roundup when they got in at 7am. Yeah. And they they always do well for yeah. clicks and that's why... They no, listen, I, I look at the BBC thing first first thing every morning, really, mm. because that's the, you know, that encapsulates everything in the paper. But I think, I, I think it's a little bit of a... a little bit of a cheat almost, because... That's probably the wrong word, but... By producing that, it gives the impression, the BBC gives the impression that that's where you read the story first. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and, you know, obviously that's, that's, so it's quite clever in a way and obviously brings you into the, to the website. But I think that's different to that roundup because it's, it, it's entitled the gossip, yeah. you know, gossip. So it's making it, it, it's quite clear what that is. It's the other ones where it's like, sensational signing today Liverpool set to make a sensational offer because it's appeared on an obscure Italian website and it's just lifted and it and then it's like reports so, such and such but I think you've got a duty to 
certainly the the type of journalism that that we that we've known you've got a duty to go and try and check that out rather yeah. than just report it and i think that's the difference you don't want that type of that to sort of thrive against with with what you what you regard as yeah because more cause, credible journalism because yeah. a day in a life for you for instance will still be quite old school and that you know you might you might see something you might hear something but then it, it's going to be checked out with a series of phone calls isn't it it isn't jump straight on the keyboard no, it, regurgitate it and just put it no, out there no sometimes you know you'll you'll maybe make less phone calls on something than others because as, as i say you have just a and the cater one yesterday was an example of that because of the authenticity of of the original story so you know you'll make you'll make some calls but you know that something's going on with that one so you may be whereas i think there's have they been linked we've been linked with the severe goalkeeper this morning yeah so i'd be more reticent i'd want more i'd, I'd want to make more calls on that one than i would do on cater because we know cater's a target yeah. we know Red Bull are back in training today. It's, pl- it's highly plausible that he'll go and uh, speak to the to the president or the chief executive there. Um, so on that one, yesterday there was, you know, you speak to a German journalist, for example, try and speak to people in and around the club, although the club really aren't. Well, they're not saying anything on stuff like that. Um, try and speak to Red Bull whose stance all along has been, uh, he's not for sale. So once you've made those calls, you, you're pretty much informed and built built a bit of a jigsaw puzzle and you know, you think, yeah, that's that's plausible, that, that story's not, you know, you can, you can go and publish that story, whereas with the severe goalkeeper, you'd want a definitive, yes, he is a target and you probably won't get that at the moment. Because Klopp's on record are saying he's not looking to sign a goalkeeper. So Loris Karras' agents on record are saying that the player's not leaving. Um, um, Huddersfield managers on record saying Danny Ward's coming back. So why are Liverpool spending 12... Why, according to this report, are Liverpool spending 12 million on new new goalkeeper? It just doesn't add up, that one. So you'd have to go away and make more phone calls before you before you would even think about publishing that yeah. story yeah all right well that's been paul joyce from the times uh, thanks very much paul for coming in and good luck unpicking it all for the rest of the summer <laughs> thanks very much to paul joyce there from the times and uh, next up in this transfer special then is neil sang who is a football agent Joined now by Neil Sang, uh, a former football player and now a football agent uh, based in Liverpool. Uh, Neil, just to, to start us off, really, if you just tell us a little bit about how you got into being a football agent and, and your background, maybe some of the people you've represented and, and still do represent. Yeah, of course. Um, I was a former player. Um, grew up uh, supporting Liverpool, played for Everton. So I call myself a Roo. I'm a red and a blue, <laughs> just try and sit on the fence there, keep everyone happy. Um, but no, it's uh, I played for Everton in the resis and um, a mate of mine who was a year younger than me, a lad called Ian Jenkins. Uh, I was getting, in, I was into sort of non-league football at the time, drifting down the pyramids. And I'm sure there'll be chance in this in this podcast to give you some real honesty about my career. But um, I didn't have the, the resilience to, to fight against the um, uh, me sort of waning if you like I just I, I just couldn't do it so I got to about 25, 26 and, and Ian Jenkins said to me he said why don't you come and represent me and I said me be an agent one of them not a <laughs> chance so he said so when we were sitting having our uh, our Sunday we have, we have a Chinese banquet in ours not a roast and my brother said why don't you ask him why I asked you so I did and he said well you'll tell her how it is he said you know football you love the game you know loads of people in it and I'd love you to have a, have a go at representing me I'll think about it, I said. Then a week later, he rang me and said, listen, I've got five clients lined up, including me. So you've got your own little agency of players already. I thought, you know what? I'll have a little go. And it just spiraled from there. So I tried to do things differently. Um, and so it was just having that football background gave me a real good springboard into it. Um, so it's uh, it's been really good. So players that we've, we've represented, we've had lads, young lads at Liverpool's over the years who haven't quite got there. Um, we've had lads playing for England, lads at Everton, lads at Man City, 
Um, but it's just one of those. I, you just got to keep growing and learning every day, haven't you? And it's a, it's, it's, it's a brilliant journey, so I'll, I'll keep cracking on for the time being. Well, you said there that you you know you wanted to do things differently, and you mentioned sort of when this idea got suggested to you, you were like, what, what one of them? So yeah. You sort of, so you sort of you were aware from the very start that there's a there's a, there's a problem, isn't there, with perception of agents, what people think of them, how they perceive them. They think it's Absolutely. some fat fella with a big cigar who's, yeah. who's only in it for themselves, don't they? Definitely, they do. And, and I've had some funny stories along the way Robbo with in terms of um uh people so so one 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 story was I got to a window with Shrews because that's where Ian Jenkins played and I gave me name in and she went oh yeah you're one of them aren't you the lady said I said one of what she said you're one of them agents you aren't you she went we don't like people like you and I said well you know what I said I'm a dad so I've got newborn babies at home I said I'm I think I'm an alright fella I said I'm polite I said please when ask for me tickets I'll say thank you when I get them in my hand if you're still <laughs> going to give me them I said you know what I said judge me as you find me don't judge me on perception and from that moment on she was the club secretary from that moment on she was different class with me and I had the same one it was only a, a lower down deal but it was a it was a lad who was playing in like the ninth tier of English football um, called Greg Blundell great lad went up and played in League One and he went to Northwich who were in the conference at the time. And when we sat down around the table, the chairman opened up with something like that. And, and players don't normally go into the, into the negotiations, by the way, but Greg's sitting next to me. Keith Alexander, God rest his soul, was the manager. Chairman was sat there. And he said, you know, I'm not used to dealing with people like you, these scumbags. He said, oh, you're only sitting here because you're getting something out of, out of this deal and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, you know, stop you there. And I said, listen, if this deal goes pear-shaped and if you think I'm an idiot, if you think I'm unfair or unreasonable or I'm greedy... No problem. Address it at the end. I said, but don't judge me at the start. I said, I said, I'm not, not the nicest kid, looking kid in the world, but don't judge me now. Judge me at the end. At the end of the meeting, about an hour we were in there, kid got a great deal. James uh, says, have you got a minute? We walked out and we went and sat in the director's box and he said, I'm humbled by what you've just done in there. He said, I can't apologise enough. And he said, that'll never happen again. I said, but listen, they're a bad agents. Judge them as you find them. So it's, you, you always get that, but as I say, I, uh, people who know me will say, he tells it how it is, he, he'll do what he says he's going to do, he'll try and over-deliver, you know, he's got a big heart, just leave it at that, and, and if, if people don't think that's good enough, fine, fi- find someone else. In terms, of, in, in terms of then how it all works, because that's really what we sort of got you in for and, and what the the show is about because yeah. we've also spoken to you know a journalist a lawyer a player right and, and what, we're, what we're trying to get into is you know i think that right now you know if you look out there on social media and that sort of thing there's frustrated fans of every club not just liverpool yeah and they're like you know we know that liverpool want player x we know that player x wants to come by the sounds of it as well why can't they just get it done and and when you i think you know you see things like for instance oh you know club x wants Wants forty-two million. Liverpool are paid to pay thirty-five. Why don't they just meet in the middle then and get it done? And and I, and I think when there's like any time lag, yeah, I think fans look at it and just go, "Well, what's going on? Like, what what's happening behind the scenes? Why why does it seem so convoluted and difficult? Is it convoluted and difficult? Very very difficult at times, particularly at the top level. Um, it's one of those where you, it's dead. Like people think negotiation is. Um, and and you know what? And, uh, commonly, the fans think it's let's just meet in the middle. Yeah, that that's the common thought. Uh, negotiations run so so much deeper than that uh, in terms of football transfers. So uh, and you know what? There's still chairman and chief executives that say to me, "Let's meet in the middle," and I go, "What are you offering?" And they'll go, "Well, you know, our offer might be let's just pick a figure out out my backside, uh, twenty grand a week." And I go, "Okay, tell you what, then I'll have a million quid a week. Should we meet in the middle?" <laughs> And they go, eh. so you can't negotiate yeah. like that. So I, I try and um, I try and put a bit more reason and a bit more rationale behind it. And if I can actually reason things that I'm that I'm actually requesting off a club, I'm at least one up. If you can then reason and ra- give me some rationale back as to why you want to pay a lower figure for them, then that's fine. Now that's that's the, the same whether it's players' wages or same whether it's between the two clubs on the transfer fees. So there's a lot of a lot of different things. I mean, there's a million bits of mechanisms that go in there. Again, as an example, there'll be relocation things for a player coming into Liverpool Football Club. Uh, his kids might need schooling. Club might take care of that. There might, you know, there's going to be agents fees involved. There's tons and tons and tons of different little things. And a lot of times, the things that hold up a deal can actually be the player's living situation. Where's he going to live? Where's his kids going to go to school? His missus wants to work, but she's got to leave her job, so you're going to find her another job. It's not always the transfer fee. 
I mean, that, that that's commonly what it is. But again, it, it's not always that. There's, mm. there's tons of different things that, that make up a transfer. And, and another one for you as well is, you know, obviously the way things have gone this summer and what's been reported in the press and, you know, the big the big hoo-ha about Van Dijk, basically. Mm. Uh, with that, it seemed, you know, if we believe everything we, we read, uh, it was all pretty much done and dusted. The club wanted to come to... Sorry, the player wanted to come to Liverpool. Liverpool wanted him. He likes Klopp, blah, 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 blah. And perhaps it seems too much leaked into the into the press, into the public sphere and Southampton got a bit of a cob on and said they were going to report Liverpool and blah, blah, blah. And everyone went mad, including me. Slagged Liverpool off. <laughs> uh, said, what are they doing behind the scenes? They should sack someone and all that. I, I literally did say that. Um, <laughs> but you know what? They might. <laughs> they might do, yeah. But, might. I mean, but I mean, it's not uncommon, is it? You know, they, we, we've said this all the way through this show. I think, you know... They, Club speaking to the players, it it goes on, doesn't it? I mean, we don't yeah. like it to be all very Corinthian, and you go and knock on Everton's door and say, "Hi, we'd like to speak to X," you know. Yeah. But it it just doesn't work like that, does it? No, typically again they'll sound an, an agent out because again top level deals, there is so much time and effort put into them. You know, they've got to cut their their budget cloth accordingly, and um, whether it's, whether it's transfer fees, wages, all that sort of thing. If if a club can save ten million quid on a transfer fee, that might be the making of a deal. Because then they can funnel that into the player, you know, and get get your likes of a, an Alexis Sanchez who's now wanting three hundred grand a week wherever he goes. I'm not saying they'll come to Liverpool, but you you get me point. If a club can save on a transfer fee, it filters down. So I think um, I just think, as I say, I think that there's so many different things and elements that go in there. It's always really difficult to put to put your finger on 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 why. But typically, what what happen is clubs will sound an agent out and say, you know, if if we're in for your player, does he fancy you? Uh, and and the agent will go, if he knows, he'll tell him. If he doesn't know, he'll say, leave it with me. And you'd speak to your client and you'll go, Liverpool are in for you, Virgil, what do you think? And he'll go, not a chance. Um, don't like Jurgen Klopp, played against his team, don't like his style of it, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, or the agent might say, well, Liverpool are in, but you know what, if you hang fire, at Barcelona are nearly there. So players' jobs and, and, and agents' jobs are always in the public domain to try and seem as if, you know, the, the you know, I'm happy at Southampton and until Southampton tell me otherwise, there's always that public voice. But behind the scenes, Van Dyke, I'll, I'll guarantee, will be saying to his agents, if Southampton wants 60 million, that means my wages are going to go through the roof. It means I'm going to be in a team or a club that's going to, that's going to win something. Or you would like to think if they've got, if they've got 60 million to spend, yeah. I'm going to win something. Get me gone. I would be, I would be gobsmacked if he's still at Southampton come the end of the window. Gobsmacked. And I think he'll be at Liverpool. I mean, the other thing as well I wanted to talk on is it, sort of, I guess, a term for it could be, it's again something, it, it's it's maybe a perception thing, but I think I think agents are tired with the, this idea that there's almost like a darker arts going on to get to get a player to move. So, you know, manipulating the press, uh, unsettling the player, sort of, you know, what you said before really about the idea that, you know, everyone's looking at you and going, well, you're just in it because you get a chunk of this deal. Yeah. And so there's this idea that all agents are permanently trying to unsettle their clients and permanently looking for, you know, a, the grass being greener elsewhere and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Again, is that unfair? And is it in fact, what is, is it in fact, you know, some people might do that, but others won't. And Yeah, I think again, agent to agents, I think there'll, there'll definitely be agents out there who do that. Um, but I find it, I find it bizarre. I, I remember I got slaughtered by um, Hugh Jenkins um, and Lee Deneen at Swansea in the press. We're going to distance ourselves from Neil Sang. We'll never deal with him ever again. Um, blah, 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 blah. And what was the reasoning? Well, well, I'll tell you the reasoning. That was the public. Neil Sang hasn't conducted himself properly. Now, I could have sued on that because I, I, said, I rang Hugh Jenkins and said, you need to retract that. I said, because what does that mean? And I said, and I'm not going to go all out on it. I said, because... You know, fans who will look at me, they're, they're not they're, a player's not going to stop signing for me. I said, I'm just marking your card that that's poor show. Mm. What actually happened behind the scenes was um, Bristol City bid a million quid for the star player, Lee Trundle, who I happen to represent. And I happen to have a great relationship with Hugh Jenkins. And the second it didn't go his way, there was a big statement in the press that Neil Sang, we're going to distance ourselves from, from Neil Sang. And actually, Lee Trundle says in his book, Sangy got blamed for it. He said, but you know what? It was me. Something really turned me on by the fact that I was going to be sold for a million quid. A lad who only four or five years before was playing non-league football. There's something that was really sexy about that. And I said, great, if, if you want it to happen, we'll make it happen. Because Swansea were rejecting the fee. Mm. So then I go in and say, listen, Lee really wants it, blah, 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 blah. And he says, because you're going to get a big fee. I said, 
irrespective. And then that's another mis- sort of a, a misconception from the public that play agents get paid percentages of transfer fees and stuff like that. They don't. I've seen that written loads of times yeah, in the yeah, press. Yeah. Let me put it on record. They don't. They get a percentage of the um, of the player's terms. And it's typically between 5 and 10%. Typically. More typically 5, the lower end, than 10. Foreign agents, continental agents will always go 10% because it's, it's more than norm in, in, in your France, Spain, Germany and whatever else. Um, so th- whether your player stays or goes, it doesn't matter because Lee Trundle would, would have got an uplift at Swansea. So you get 5% of his new deal anyway. So it wasn't the fact that I'm the chairman saying, oh, you're getting more money going to Bristol City. Well, only if they pay more than you're prepared to give them on a new deal. Well, then, yeah, <laughs> I will get more. But so will Lee Trundle. And that's who I work for. I don't work for you. So it's, I always say this, the agent's so easy to blame. Yeah. And listen, sometimes there are so many wrongings out there. And with the deregulation from FIFA of agents, rules and all that, there are so many wrongings. It's gone a little bit back wild west. But again... That doesn't mean to say I, I have to swell the ranks of the of the charlatans. I just get on and do what I've got to do, and, and it's about building relationships and keeping it right. But um, I think it's uh, as I said, it's dead easy to blame the agents, isn't it? And, and and fans of of this one might blame Van Dykes. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. is that what's going on? Is that what you've heard? I don't uh, know. Well, yeah, there's, there's very, as as ever on that one. There's there's various different you know stories kicking about, none of which we could particularly verify, I don't think, but you know, there's the idea that the, someone's been a bit leaky at the club and, and got mouthy and said something where they shouldn't. There's yeah. the idea that something's come from an agent. There's an idea that someone, a player, said yeah. something somewhere and, you know, I mean, with that one, there was, it was just, I think I think it was the level of detail on it that, that scuppered it. You know, all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's in Blackpool. It's a specific place in Blackpool. You know, yeah. someone's mouthed off there. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea yeah. that just, you know, a manager's met a player, well, that you know, as I've said earlier in, in this very show, you know, read read players' autobiographies is happening all the time, and it's gone on for years, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Service stations and all that sort of thing. Yeah, they've gone up a level if they're going to Blackpool, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but uh, and I think I think maybe we're we're you know if we're putting two and two together a bit, it seems to me that Southampton just thought you're, you're almost saying this is exclusive to Liverpool now, and it's done, and we can't have our, have our little. Yeah public auction around the player because you know supposedly Chelsea were interested Arsenal were interested and maybe yeah. they were looking forward yeah. to the idea yeah. of playing them all off against each other and that happens as well yeah. that happens but you know on, on the um, the leak Robber what I'd say there is I'd say um, you think about the, the mechanism of a transfer it's really hard for it not to get out yeah. they're decent oh Michael Edwards is to blame he needs shooting sport and direct he's only a young lad but he hasn't got a clue it's dead easy to again point the finger of blame but, so I feel sorry for him. I've read a few bits about him from fans that, you know, he he wants um, lambasting over it. Think about this. So Liverpool won Van Dijk. They'll talk about it internally. So there's several people know. Then they might get in touch with the agent. The agent might will, will then get in touch with his clients. The agent might tell a couple of his colleagues if he has any. The player then might go, what's Jürgen Klopp like? Joe Bloggs, you've played for him. Then he might go, what's Liverpool Football Club like? You've been there, which might be Lallana or Klein or whoever, 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 whoever he's played with. And then Klein goes, oh, I've had Virgil on there to his agent. And his agent goes, nothing to do with me. Speaks to a reporter and goes, "Yeah, Liverpool are into Virgil van Dijk. You owe me a favour. Oh, what a great scoop that is. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's out of control. Yeah. Who, who do you blame? Yeah, I, was exactly. at, I was at a League 2 club, did a deal for a client um, last week. And uh, the manager came to me and went, we've got a mole. We've got it. I said, what do you mean? Just that on the unofficial... Um, Twitter account a really experienced player who's been a captain a captain of his former club signing it he's in for his medical he said you've only been here half an hour it's just got out he said we're going to sort it and I said I said the same thing I said think about it and he's a new manager this, this this guy I said think about it I said you know what if you drive yourself mad with stuff like that you'd never be out on the grass doing your job because there's so much that you're not in control of in football so much of it. Well, you just can't control that message can you because no. like, as you say it's Especially like, you know, at Liverpool's level, like everyone knows what Van Dyke looks like. Everyone knows what yeah. Klopp looks like. And you just need one person with a the phone. They go on the Twitter, they, they've took a picture <laughs> exactly. and then and then it's off the stories away, isn't it? And, and it's not like, I mean, we, we had Paul Joyce on earlier and, you know, Paul was talking about, you know, he does, he, he, he is one of the ones that tries to verify stories properly. He'll speak to a number of sources. 
Not everyone's like that, though, are they? No. I, I, and, and loads of people no. will add two and two together and come up with about twenty two, and, yeah. and, and lash it all over Twitter. They want the retweets. They want the you know they want the attention for it. Definitely. And then and then you're away. The story's gone. Definitely. The story's got legs. Yeah, definitely. Well, think about it as an agency. If I can get a, if I can curry a bit of favour with a journalist or somebody knowing a scoop on something, why aren't I going to do it? I don't look after Virgil Van Dijk, so why do I care? I'm getting a bit of favour over here from this. That might benefit one of my clients down the line, and that's what I've got to do. Yeah. I've got to be, always be fighting for my clients. So, you know, you, you look at the Van Dyke. Well, I look at the Van Dyke situation, and it, it did become a bit of a royal mess in the end. But you know what? And, and, this is, and this is the thing. I get why clubs will speak to agents first. I do, I get that. However, if Liverpool had gone through the right channel, if they had rang up the chief exec or the sporting director or the chairman of Southampton and said, we've had our internal chat. We want him. And do the deal that way. You know, they could even say then, would he come? If Southampton then want to go to Virgil van Dijk and say, listen, Liverpool want you, would you go? He can say back, no. Or, do you know what? Yeah, I'd really fancy that. Okay, great. Now we know that Virgil. Keep it under wraps. Only the people at Liverpool know. You know. It doesn't go anywhere. Let's do our transfer contract. But they've also then got within their own rights then to, to launch it all around Europe because he's a top centre-half. You know, he's somebody you could see mm. being in a, a Liverpool team that wins the league. He's that good. So, but if you go through the right channels, there's never any egg on your face then at Liverpool. You do it, you try and agree your fee with Southampton. If you do it and it's going somewhere, then you might get into the player and say, we believe you've given this, this a bit of a thumbs up. Here's the type of salary we think you could earn it at our club. Listen, push your end as well. Because that's again common and maybe the fans don't really know that. But it, se- it seems like from, from the Liverpool perspective, suspect- I can't even speak, perspective yeah. this summer, that... On a number of occasions now that Liverpool are doing it the other way round. So you know, mm. the, there's the Van Dijk one, which we, which we you know we've discussed and is well reported. Yeah. But Salah, even you know, that's done and it's it's done and dusted, and he's he's done the lead and he's posed the scarf and the shirt and all that. Yeah. But it was reported weeks and weeks before that happened that he'd agreed personal terms and that he was going to triple his wage and all this sort of thing. And it's like, oh, well, hang on. You know, and again, when you're looking at it from outside, you're like, "Well, that's mad, isn't it? How can they agree personal terms over here when they haven't even when Roma haven't even said they're selling them, and, yeah. they, and Liverpool and Roma haven't even agreed the fee?" And then we've got a similar one now. It seems with Keita uh, reported yesterday in the papers that again Liverpool have said, "Well, if you come to Liverpool." And it's very specific figures every time as well when these things are getting, you know, <laughs> yeah. you'll get £130,000 a week. And then and then there's the line that, oh, you know, and he's happy to go. Yeah. But it's all about now whether uh, the club will sell and how much they'll sell for and all this. And it's like, it seems a bit, it, it's, and I'm not I'm not obviously in the industry, but it, it seems to me, and I've, I've seen a lot of fans say similar, it seems a bit of arse about it. So why don't they, because yeah. you know, why don't they go to the club first and say, we definitely want him. We're prepared to pay 60. Yeah. Are you interested in that? Yeah. And they might go, no, fuck off, we're definitely not selling them. <laughs> yeah. Or they might go, well, <laughs> well, if you're up your money, we might do. And, and then don't isn't shouldn't that be the point you start at, talking to the player? I mean, I guess the problem is there's no hard and fast rules and it's all a bit, it, it can get messy. It, it, is, it? it is messy. You're right, Rob. It, it's messy and it's and it is um, it, it can be cloak and dagger because, again, think about it. So, so going on from what I said before, the way to do it is go through the front door, can we agree a fee, blah, 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 blah. Now, if that's the only thing you do as a club, you're actually being daft because everybody else is doing it differently. Some might go through the front door first, others might go to the player, and is it, or not the player, but the agent first, and, and get that one. But if a club only went through the front door, we're all, all the clubs and all the players and all the agents in business to try and get themselves the best deal, aren't they? Mm. So that club is going to go, tell you what, Liverpool have just, get right out, out the gate, just bid 40 million. Right, get on the phone to all our oppos around Europe, will anyone go more? And so then, what happens then is you would, as Liverpool Football Club, you wouldn't want that to happen. You wouldn't want Southampton to hawk your mm. fair offer going through the front door. You've conducted it properly, forty million through the front door, whatever it is. You wouldn't want them to hawk that round. So guess what you do next? You might do it that way at the start, but then you'll go to the agent and say, "Listen, we'll give him two hundred grand a week. He's probably not going to get that anywhere else, but we'll give him two hundred grand a week. We'll nail him on with a mega deal because we think he's going to be a centre half for our club for for the next ten years." Um, tell you what now we think alright we'll go to 50 but we think that's unbelievably fair given the bad injury you've just had you want your 200 grand a week son go and fight your corner 
say to Southampton, I don't care if you get a £100 million bid in from anywhere else. I don't like the sun in Spain. I'm not going. I don't like Germany. It ain't happening. I'm going to Liverpool because those people in Liverpool are phenomenal. And all my mates are there. And blah, 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 blah. I'm going there. So you might go through the front door day one. But day two, three, four, five, you might say, you want a bit of this? Go and fight your corner because we're not paying a penny more. So, but again, that's just savvy business. And again, everyone knows it goes on, but actually pinning it down and saying, all right, I'm going to sanction you, I'm going to blame you. It's never happening because yeah. you, can't, you can't pinpoint it. I mean, I thought it was interesting as well that even before the season was over, so I think it was the, I think it was the press conference he did before the Middlesbrough game, that Klopp was asked about transfers and asked about the summer and all that. Of course he was. And he basically said something along the lines of, well, we've done a lot of the hard work already. Uh, which which was interesting. I mean, you know, it was interesting, interesting, but also you could work that out. I mean, it's not like they, they just they just put pins in a page and go, well, he's sound. They obviously look at players over a long period of time. But also, he said something like, um, and, and we've had a lot of the conversations already. And then you know, when you bolt that onto what's then <laughs> happened, you're like, well, what are they, what you know, what are they up to here? But also, as well, it's dead interesting that another pattern that seems to have emerged is it's actually Klopp. Klopp speaking to all these players. It's not like it's not some. <laughs> yeah. It's not Michael Edwards. It's not an agent. It's not some intermediary. He's going. Yeah. He's going and knocking. He's doing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's the thing. And and that's unusual. But as because I said before, it's done. Everyone can speculate and and everyone can can sort of deflect blame and whatever else. But if a manager's saying that he's going to do it, listen. If it's if it's nailed on and, and Liverpool agree with Roma for Salah, great. Klopp should turn up to that first meeting and say. Yeah. And sell the club to him. And then it's up to Michael Edwards in the hierarchy to go and do the, the players' terms and whatever else. But if, I don't know whether you're saying this, if Klopp is saying, I've spoken to Van Dijk and I've had a gab with him and this and that and the other, then that's just got to be a big no-no. Because mm. you're actually just you're just incriminating yourself, aren't you? Well, you know? And that's what seems to happen. You know, it was reported that they were in Blackpool together and blah, blah, blah. And then Definitely. I, I, think, I think the actual wording in some of the reports, I think that's what got up Southampton's nose. It was along the lines of, Something like he's indicated, he's he's indicated to Liverpool that he, he likes Jurgen Klopp and he wants to play for Liverpool. And I, and I thought you know so being so definitive before a fee was even agreed. Yeah. I think in their boardroom they've gone. You know what? I'm fed up with this. Yeah. Let, let, let's get it out there that we're reporting them. Let's you know let's go to the, the yeah league or definitely. Whatever. And it's a shame you know as well because Liverpool have given Southampton tens of millions of pounds yeah. over the last two or three seasons haven't they and so you'd, you would like to think that there's a good relationship there so for it to go a little bit that way seems a bit bonkers to me because I would have thought that because when I saw it all going a bit pear-shaped and they're going to get Liverpool are going to get sanctioned it comes up doesn't it breaking news yeah. uh, and I'm thinking come on where, why aren't they pulling on on existing relationships here and saying because um, the likes of um, Les Reed who's the, the sporting director Ross Will I don't know Les but Ross Wilson the assistant sporting director I know quite well and he's a phenomenal fella um, so there is there's always the suggestions of what's going on I'm giving you some insight into uh, suggestions of what can happen I'm not saying they do yeah. I'm not saying they don't I don't want to incriminate me or anybody else in, in this what I'm saying I'm trying to give some insight into if you were a club wouldn't that be the savvy way? But as I said, it's dead easy to, to turn around and, and take something out of context in a in a in a report that Jurgen Klopp's apparently said such and such. Jurgen Klopp might not have done. Mm. That reporter might just be writing a load of nonsense to make himself look great to his boss. Because you know, some reporters are under pressure, aren't they? Yeah. And so now we're talking about players, sporting directors, agents, managers, chief executives, journalists, blah, blah, blah. There's so many different cogs in this wheel of a transfer that you probably never ever really know the truth. It's just it's it's just a, a a mad mixed world, but but it's one that endlessly entertains us, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, it definitely does that. Uh, do you think? Do you think the whole process maybe needs needs more rules and regulations? Should you mentioned it being a bit wild westy and that sort of thing? You know, should I don't know? Should there be a, a proper license and thing around agents? Do you think? And I mean, there has been there has been they've tried it, haven't they? Mm. Um, I, I, and what's happened in in the past is. Um, There'll be agents there, or there'll be guys masquerading as agents who aren't licensed. Uh, they've got no one to sanction them. So if they do anything untoward, there's no one can sanction them. And then if, if lo, be, lo and behold, they get a player over the line with a the club, they'll just bring a lawyer in to sign it off. 
So that's always been around. So what have the rules meant then for those people? Because again, it's business. Like I said before, it's business. If a club can get a, a better deal by orking someone's offer around, they're gonna do it because it's mm. business. If an agent can get his client and himself a better deal by orking it around, he might well do that. Um, so you've got to look at it and think, well, all the mechanisms involved. Um, will rules and regulations really, really help? Because they've tried it. Yeah. They've tried it. Um, we, there was a, I was a founder member of the uh, the agents association. It was called AFA, uh, Association of Football Agents, run by uh, Paul Gascoigne's old um, agent Mel Steen, who's a lawyer in London. Um, and and we were trying to get to a, a mode of policing ourselves a little bit as well. That if you were a member of the association, you had to sign up to a certain set of values and morals and a code, a code of ethics. If somebody was stepped out of line, you could sanction them in a certain way. Things So become that self-policing body. But because there's so many agents now and, and FIFA with their deregulation, it just it just sort of unsettled the association a little bit. That Because I said there could be, I think there's something now, um, something like 15, 1,600 licensed agents in the country. Under those licensed agents, there'll probably be another several thousand, I'm going to pick a figure of maybe say six, seven thousand people working under the umbrella of those agents. And then on top of that, there's probably several thousand people masquerading as agents on their own. So you're probably talking into the 10, 15 thousands. Mm. There's only 2,000 professional players. Not no. everyone's making money. Yeah. And, and add into that, that's just in this country, add into that, the vast majority of the top level where all the big money is, they're foreign players anyway. So guess what? They've got foreign agents. So then that swells the numbers. So it's just... It just becomes mind-boggling to police. I'm not saying don't have any regulation. I'm not. I'm not advocating that. Um, but I just feel sorry for the authorities that a lot of times at the FA they're non-football people. Then if I went in and said, "Let me, let me help you write up some regulations from things that I've seen in the game," and then bring on a few other people in who you know are, are decent guys, they might get some really good insight to do something about it. But they never do. There's maybe an arrogance at the FA. I, I feel sometimes that they won't entertain. Certain people, maybe the change. I think Greg Clark, if I'm right, he's still the, the chairman. I think uh, was he the guy who did, did the parliamentary commission? Um, yeah. Uh, recently, and he spoke quite candidly, and I quite like that. It was on for a couple of hours, and I watched it all quite candid. And I thought he was good, so maybe it would change. I mean, I don't know, but there just needs to be. They, they need more insight. They can't get insight from the media, having a few corridor chats, a few meetings of clubs. Yeah. They need deep insight. Otherwise, it's just gonna. It's just going to carry on and, and, and rules will be broken. But I guess what you have got now then, because of the way it is, is that, and because of the level of competition by the sounds of it between agents, mm. I guess what you have got then is, is weirdly, it, it will self-police in a way because, you know, if you if you were a terrible agent, mm. word would get round that you were, wouldn't it? And, you know, therefore other players wouldn't sign up, would you? Do you know what I mean? So, like, it, it must get a... I mean, yeah I, and no. What, well, go on. Yeah and no. Uh, I, I, know, I mean, obviously, I won't name any names, but I know that are agents... Who, who have shafted players royally but still get clients and it bugs the life out of me. <laughs> I go to, I look at players and go, but you know he's done that to him but you still, you've still signed on with, with this guy. Why? And you know all it is? It's that simple choice of, yeah, but I know he can get me a move to that club because he's best mates with the chairman. Right. Whether an agent's bent or not, whether he's a good guy or not, a player typically will go, he says my needs. Whether that needs is, I want as much money as I can get. I want the best move I can get. Or, or those needs might be, I want some real support and some love. I want a little bit of a little bit of care. Yeah. I want somebody to manage my life as well off the pitch and support me with that sort of stuff. It just depends. Everyone's different. Yeah. That's why there's loads of agents out there serving all the needs. But so there are bad agents. So you would think they'd get sort of blackballed in the game agents who are who are um, who are dodgy or, or crap at what they do. But. Yeah, as I said, if it serves a purpose for the players, he's always going to join them. Last of all, then, I just wanted to ask you about more, more, the human side of footy because we always talk about it on here and I think it's a conversation that goes a little amiss in the, in the wider football world. So, mm. you know, how, how important is that to you? And also, do you, does football collectively do enough for it? And what I mean by all this is, so we've had, we've had players on here, players who are still playing as well, who, who have said things like, um, you know, They'll just get a call out of nowhere from the club, basically going here. We've accepted a bid from X, and here we want you to go. Yeah, and and like you know, we've been sitting there when that player is saying that, going, "Well, that's a bit cold, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? That's 
and, and it's just, oh, well, that's the way football is, and it's cutthroat, and so what, deal with it. Yeah. And then, you know, you talk as well about, you know, sort of kids who don't make it and drop off out of academies and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we always say, well, you know, shouldn't someone be doing something with them and, like, checking they're okay? You shouldn't, they shouldn't just be allowed to drop off at the end, should they? You should look, you know, the, the club should look after them. So so do they in general, and, and is enough being done around that, or is that an area for improvement, do you think? For major, footy? major improvement. Um, uh, and I get why clubs don't do it. You know, clubs will clubs will will release a player and it's sort of they're done because clubs are in the business of producing players and and making money. Um, their businesses now, aren't they? The, as I said, I think the the romantic or so I won't say all of it, but some of the romantic elements has gone. Um, I th- where you know Liverpool will look after their own or Everton would do the same or or, or Tottenham or, or whatever. It's he's not going to be good enough in our first team. We get rid. And it is it's as cold as that. Mm. But players and agents get blamed loads for it. Like if a player wants to leave, so Virgil van Dijk wants to leave Southampton, he'll get pelters in the press from all the Southampton fans. But the second that Southampton, their beloved club, who Virgil said he doesn't want to go, the second they release four kids from Southampton who've been born and raised in the city and been at their academy since seven years of age, have been to 18 unceremoniously, fans don't not bother then, are they? Mm. What, where's their beloved club then? So, but you know what? The owner should be on on clubs to do that. I think again, the FA can do way more in terms of educating parents as to the other choices and the second and the plan B, if you like. And I hear this all the time. I, you know, all these these motivations stuff. Plan Plan A is good enough. We don't need Plan B. If you work hard enough for Plan A, Plan B is not needed. Yeah, and I get a bit of that as well. Mm. Um, but let's just look at the numbers here. The percentages. The percentages are horrific for players making it, particularly at the top level. Um, so yeah, major onus on, on on clubs to do it. It wouldn't be hard for them with the with the money available and the resources they've got to put a plan in place to get kids into other clubs because they say, "Oh, we'll get you a child in another club, son." Very rarely do they. Sometimes if they're a really good kid, they will, but but very rarely. Um, so I try and fill that gap, and I see part of my role as an agent is trying to fill that gap. Um, so I had a, a, a lad released from a club um, a couple of years ago, really, really bright lad, mum a lawyer, dad had his own uh, business, um, and I, I just said, listen, States, go to the States, educate yourself. He, he, he lacked a little bit of confidence um, at his club. I said, go and be the best player, go and be... The main man, and he's there, and he's been he's been voted one of the best players in the country, and he'll come back and have a big future. So that was great. So that was but that was my suggestion. It wasn't his club suggestion. Mm. It was my suggestion. His club suggestion was go to Hull on trial, and I said, and if you don't make it there, what? I said, but listen, if you want to go, I'll support you, and let's talk about that. So I just try and fill that gap. But clubs, FA, everyone, again as a collective, should do it. And the FA, and and, and maybe this is the other thing as well, Robbo, is that again I talked about deep insight before. I see the pain on these kids when they're released. And I'm not the type of agent who'll be as cold as a come and go, oh, well, you mean, yeah, see you then. you're no commission to me. I'm off as well. Lads who I know, I could give you a million names, or oh, fight and fight and fight to get them at Warrington Town or, you know, Ballatown in the League of Wales or Bangor City or, or you know, Macclesfield Town, wherever it is, mm. I'll, I'll fight. And I'll still represent them when they're there because they might come again. But I think, again, giving deep insight into the FA as to what football actually does to these kids' mentalities when they release them, um, I think that they need to see it. I think they need to see it and feel it a bit more rather than just talk about it. Um, but I think um, I think there are, there are one or two clubs. I think Liverpool are decent at it. In fairness, I think they help. Uh, they've got they've got a really good education and welfare um, department there. So topically for, for the Anfield rap, I think Liverpool Football Club are as good as it gets in that in that department. Well, that's good. I think that's good to hear for us, for us fans because you know as much as we want to win the league and buy top players and all that, I, I sort of like the fact that you know. Liverpool does things right as well. I mean, I'm I'm always moaning about uh, Liverpool doing a bit more in the community as well. But that's a, that's for another show. Yeah. Um, Neil, thanks very much for joining us. My uh, pleasure. Really, really interesting, and uh, we'd love to have you on again sometime. Definitely. Big thanks to Sangi there. Really interesting stuff. Uh, next up, then we have Stephen Warnock, who, who normally is on our Pro View show. Uh, just a little chat with Stephen about transfers and what it's like being a player and going through that process. So to look at a, a transfer from a player's perspective, we've got Stephen Warnock here. Um, Steve, just just talk us through really what you know what transfers have been like for you, where how they work, how, how the negotiation goes, what it feels like to be involved in a transfer as well. Just you know, give give us a bit of an insight from your perspective, really. Um, it can be either straightforward or it can be long and drawn out. I think. Um 
I think I mentioned on a previous show when I was at Blackburn, how uh, a transfer, f- uh, or when I was at Liverpool and going to Blackburn, how a transfer fell through because Lucas Neal went to West Ham and sort of, um, the, I was on the last day of the window, I was on my way down to Blackburn um, and then it fell through and I waited for six months for it to come back around and I remember it being July, uh, January and you're thinking, well, it'll happen on the 1st of January because everything was agreed last time and whatever, but um, I think it dragged on till about the, the 13th or 14th of, of January that time. Um, and it's just... I think once you, you get the green light from your agent to, to go to the ground, <coughs> you, you're just going there thinking, well, everything's been agreed contract-wise, money-wise and things like that, and now it's a case of getting through the medical and, and doing the medical and... Some people's medicals are more strict than others and some are quite quite lenient, if you like. Um, I remember at Blackburn when I'd been there a year or two or and Sam Allardyce come in and uh, any player that came in, um, we had M- Michelle Salgado come into the club and you had to do a fitness test going into the club to see if you were at the level that he thought you, you should be at. And it was, it, was a, it was a hard run. I remember watching him doing it, thinking... I would not fancy doing this on my medical. I think any medical I've done, um, I've sort of gone into the club and done a few things, um, saying that my medical at Blackburn was quite hard, but at other clubs it's been sort of scans and things like that. But Blackburn were very thorough in what they did. Um, When I went there, they were worried about the history of me breaking my leg. Um, Like, I'd done my leg three times, so they sent me to a... um, a specialist to go and speak to him and he x-rayed me, looked at my legs and sort of put me through a few sort of uh, exercises and, and looked at certain things and then when I went back to the training ground, you've got a, a machine that tests the, the strength of your legs and things like that, so I had to do a test on this machine to see that. I was knackered doing me, doing me medical thinking I best pass this and then obviously I passed it but um, it, it's always a worry when you do your medical that they'll find something that you didn't think you had there. Have you have you sort of have you felt looked after by clubs when you've been, you know, when you've been transferred out and in really? So I mean, have you felt like they've kept you in the loop? Has there been times where it's just been sprung upon you? And at the other end as well, when you do get to a club, have you felt looked after? Did 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 they help you settle down? Did they help you find a new house? What you know that type of thing? Yeah, I mean. That's part of the process. When you when you go into a club, you'll have the player's liaison officer there who basically comes, introduces him, herself, whichever it may be, and they'll um, they'll talk to you. I mean, when I went to Blackburn, I stayed where I was. I stayed mm. in Ormskirk, so it wasn't an issue for me. But uh, when I went to Villa, I went down there and there was a lady who looked after us. She actually took me to my scans and everything like that. And while we were on the way to the scan, she sort of telling you everything about the area what you're after asking you what you're after if you've got a family and they try and get as much information as they can while they're doing this and then they come back and they'll try and give you as much as they can of what you've asked for or what suits your family um so clubs are not that they have to be but they've got to be uh open when you come in to to help you settle because the quicker they can help you settle the quicker you can perform on the pitch in terms of going out as well i mean we, we've seen players you know complain at certain times that it's it, it's sprung upon them that they don't really know that they'll just get a phone call out the blue and they don't feel like it's being properly communicated to them that you know that was ever going to be a possibility i mean i remember joe allen saying that about liverpool uh, i remember speaking to to jay spearing on a <coughs> on a pro view and he he was talking about you know he just get he'd be on holidays around the pool and he's get getting a phone call saying we've accepted this offer yeah yeah I think it does happen and it goes back to that saying again this that's football and it's such a cutthroat game that uh, an industry that that does happen and you do just get a phone call and because there could be a phone call out the blue talking about another player saying. Like you go back to Jay there, and someone could have been ringing about another centre midfielder, and they suddenly gone, well, what about Spearing? And they've gone, well, um, yeah, yeah, we'll take a bid on him. Do you know all of a sudden, and mm-hmm. then it hadn't even been thought about. But if they inquired and they thought, yeah, we could actually shift him on or do something, 
then that is where you could be on holiday and suddenly you get a phone call and it's like, um, yeah, we've accepted a bit for you. But then you don't have to go. That's your decision and to either stay and fight for your place or you think, yeah, I quite fancy that and I'll give that a go myself. I mean, as part of this show as well, we've, we, we've spoken to an agent there, but, you know, what what what's your general view on agents? Do you think that how they're viewed in the in the wider world, if you like, is a little bit unfair? Because, I mean, I think they've got quite a negative rep, if you were to ask me as a football fan, but then I'm not dealing with them. So, you know, it, 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 is that fair for me to say? I think you need an agent because they've got so many ins at clubs and so many relationships that are built to sort of chairmen, scouts, managers and, and things like that. I think there's probably a, a lot of agents who who will get deals done that other agents can't get done to certain clubs because of the relationships that they have. Um, and there'll be agents that clubs won't accept and won't do deals with. Um, so then the player's actually hampered to move into that club because the club will not deal with that agent. Um They've got the pros and cons. They've got a lot of links and they've got a lot of... Uh, <coughs> say if I wanted to sign for a new club now, for me to find the numbers of, of all the managers or chief execs or chief scouts and things like that, I mean, how long is that going to take you to do? Whereas if you've got your agent and they've got all them numbers there at hand and also they know what they're asking for, as in money-wise, they know what the current market is because they might have a player who's in there. Uh, uh, under their umbrella that plays in a certain position who's at a certain club and he, he he earns a certain wage and they think well our player's better we move him to a better club so we can actually get him more money or he's not as good and we can get him a little bit less than that so their negotiation tactics are probably stronger than yours as well so I think you, you need them to a certain degree but finding the right one's very difficult Do, do, cl- do clubs ever circumnavigate sort of what, what we'd expect so so what i mean by this is you know we all think that there's these complicated and in, intense scout missions and all this and you know we've all played footy manager and we expect that that's how it goes on in the real world but sometimes could a club just be basically cut to the chase go to an agent and say listen who've you got that would fit x y and z for us and i almost let the agent do a bit of the legwork i don't think so these days with um with with the the scouting network that's about because you've got like something called like my scout and things like that that were mm. you can literally type in my name and all my clips from all my games this season that have been covered will come up and they'll show everything and that's every every little minute so you can watch anyone in so the all world. the all the clubs got that have they? I think most of the clubs use yeah. it. I think there's a few now that have uh, there's a few different things that are used but um, there's a lot of scouting things that are about so I think sometimes. If they fancy a player in South America, they can watch him first and then they can send someone out rather than sending someone out and they come back and go, wasn't even worth it. Or, yeah, we should get him, whatever. There's there's ways of saving money now for clubs going into a transfer. Because we did used to hear about sort of clubs signing players on the, on the back of a DVD, on the back of recommendations of certain agents. Do so you think it's sort of moved on a bit from that now? Yeah, I think so. I think that's probably where agents have lost their, their way a little bit in, mm. in that respect. Um, and I think the amount of money that's getting branded about now, I don't think clubs can really take that gamble to, to do that. I think a lot of clubs might have... I think it was George Ware's cousin, wasn't it, who went to Southampton or something like that. Ali Dia. Ali dear, yeah. So I don't think he cost much anyway, was it? I think he, he, it wasn't like a massive issue for him to go in there. But I think them days are gone now where you're getting George Ware's cousin going into a football club there from an agent's deal. But I think agents will they'll ring clubs and I don't think it'll be the Premier League. I think it'll be more Championship League 1, League 2 conference where we've got this player and do you fancy him or... Um, and then they say no but we're looking for a left back who have you got under your umbrella who's available and and that will happen Um, but more often than not they have an idea of what players they're after and who's about Last but not least then on this Anfield Rap transfer special we've got Oliver Hunt who's a sports lawyer from Onside Law Uh, he's going to tell us about that side of things and how that works when you're putting a transfer together Joined now by Ollie Hunt from Onside Law and Ollie's coming on to tell us about the point of view from a legal perspective around both clubs and players. 
as to how a transfer works. And you know, Ollie, you've you've had experience of working through this process on on, on both sides, uh, working with agents, working representing players directly, and working with uh, working with clubs in order to pull deals together. How complicated a process is it? I know it, that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question, but sort of how 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 complex can it be? Can it can it become to sort of to to, to pull these deals together? Uh, hello, it's um it's not complicated in terms of the legal mechanics or the legal issues at stake, but it can become complicated in terms of fitting all the jigsaws the jigsaw in piece together and um, making sure that all the, the relevant paperwork is completed in the right order. And um, there's there's lots of moving parts normally because the club may be talking to one or two different players and the selling club might have its own agenda and so on. So it's complicated on a practical and commercial level, but not necessarily a legal one. When I refer to the type of clients that you've worked with, you know, you've worked with some some pretty big names in amongst all of this, and it's you know it's worth sort of making that clear. But how do these people find you? How do they come to you in the first place? Are you out looking for them, or do they come and find you through a third party or something like that? On the whole, it tends to be word of mouth, and um, once your f- footballs are qu- quite a tight industry, and once you're known in the industry, having expertise in it. Um, work flows word of mouth really i mean the, the the deals a lawyer tends to be involved in um would would be either the real top end stuff where there's you know a huge amount of money at stake or sometimes actually the lower league stuff where they don't necessarily have the sort of expertise in house the slight the sort of middle of the road stuff often gets done actually simply between clubs without a legal involvement uh, Ollie, I just wondered, you know, f- from a supporter's perspective, uh, we, we, you know, it's summertime, we're looking at deals, we're wondering why, for instance, Liverpool can't get certain deals over the line and what, what quite the problem is. I mean, from your perspective, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, perhaps why it isn't as simple a process as people might think? So, I mean, so, you know, you mentioned before, you know, some deals can be simpler, others not so. I mean, what, what, what kind of things can take the time? I guess there's things like maybe image rights, clauses, sell-on clauses, that sort of thing. Is it all those things that you'd have to sort of churn through that can take some time? It is, yeah. There's, there's often, um, from a legal perspective, it is things like, I mean, a, an image rights um, deal doesn't tend to hold up the transfer because image rights really, um, uh, particularly amongst English clubs, because there's no third-party ownership really. And often it is unlikely for an image rights deal to hold a transfer up. But there are certain clauses within deals which, which can be slightly more complicated. And as you say, that might be a sell-on fee or it might be a release clause. Has that been triggered? Hasn't it been triggered? Um, but actually, the main hold-up tends to be not necessarily the documentation, although often lawyers get blamed for it. But, but often that's actually a bit of a sort of an excuse. Normally, it's just one piece of the jigsaw is missing, Um and that depends really on the on the bargaining power. So who is really in the driving seat here? Is it the buying club, selling club, or is it the player? And you only need one piece of the jigsaw to be slightly out of joint. And obviously the whole deal can't, can't sort of happen. Now that might be because the selling club is trying to replace that player with its own deal. And so you have lots of deals sort of working in tandem. Okay, and, and, and you know, how... How involved in general? I mean, I guess it would vary from client to client, maybe. But I mean, just also speaking in more general terms, how actually involved is a, is a player in all this? So when there is the sort of backwards and forwards and negotiations and you know all the stuff that frust- frustrates fans really when you just want to see a sort of deal over the line and a man holding the scarf at a, at a training ground, uh, you know how how involved is the player in these things in in normal circumstances? Is it mainly just agent player? lawyer or or you know how central are they to it they, they are on normally actually they're on the periphery so the player has been made aware that a club is interested and the player will either say yes i'd love to go there or not and if the player wants to go you know as part of that transfer then he will just let everybody get on with it so actually the player tends to be on the periphery of it on that then, when you're involved, because you've seen both sides of the process, with the clubs, is there often a situation where clubs are, for instance, beginning to negotiate with a player where 
they're either giving you the impression or you've got the impression this is one of many irons in the fire for that particular position. I mean, my point on this is, you know, when when we discuss sort of the reportage of transfers, it's often things look like they're, they're nailed on. Uh, and as you say before, there could be one piece of the jigsaw. But, you know, do clubs often get quite far along with a player when either you know or someone else might know or you might suspect they're just basically a fallback option and... What I'm sort of saying is, is there a lot of the time where a lot of people's time ends up effectively just being wasted? I'm sure everyone gets paid, but where the time effectively ends up being wasted? No, really, I think if you get to the point of, of negotiating terms with a player, uh, it, is, it is normally sort of um, nailed on that, that that deal will happen in terms of you know the will of the parties. It is rare, actually, if you start getting to... The yeah. discussion of terms with a player that a deal falls away. And is that the same sort of club to club as well? I know you've been on that side sort of representing a, uh, I think there's one transfer that's referenced on your testimonials, I think around, I think it's Johan Kabay, where you've, you know, is the, again, when clubs start to talk and start to talk about payment terms and all of that sort of stuff, if the, if we reach that point, are we, you know, is it, does that, do all parties expect it to be all systems go? Yeah, they do really. I mean, there's, there's often one or two parties become frustrated in the process, and and and, and that often, when there's a transfer that everybody um, wants to happen, um, if there's a hold up, the buying club and the player tend to be most frustrated because it's often the selling club starts <laughs> imposing certain conditions or or requirements. Um, so so. Yeah, I mean, it's really often that, I mean, obviously the, the sort of power really is in the selling club and, and a selling club can hold, hold you know, hold a deal up if it needs to. So in general then, if there's games being played, for want of a better phrase, and this is, but this is how sort of supporters see transfers. Firstly, there aren't as many games being played as supporters might think. But secondly, if, if things are difficult or awkward, it's more likely to be on the sort of the side of the selling club. We've got their own set of exterior sort of needs when you said before about having another player lined up. Yeah, I think um, I think games is probably a bit harsh yeah. because um, it, it, a lot of it is strategy and, and you know, a lot of it is there's a lot of money involved. Um, but yeah, I'd say if there's a hold up and most people think a deal is done, nine times out of ten, it would be the selling club because the selling club might be waiting on something or if it's a foreign club selling into the to, to, to the UK, the selling club wants a certain sort of um, a better understanding of, of the implications of, for example, payment in instalment. So if the transfer fee is going to be paid in certain chunks, they want to know how does that work under sort of the you know the relevant regulations and so on. So um, yeah, it, 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 I'd, I'd say that's a fair sort of summary, really. What, what's your what's your experience of of agents, Ollie? Because I'm, I'm always interested in this one. It, it, it sort of presented, I think, in the sort of wider world as being a bit of a sort of wild west uh, occupation almost. And I I often think, you know, we we've 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 met some ourselves. We spoke to some ourselves, and you know, varying experiences. I think would be fair to say. It, it, is that the same case for you? Do you think they get a raw deal? Do you think they've got an image problem? What, what what's your general vibe on on football agents? Yeah, I think um, as in any walk of life, there are lots of different sort of um, examples. There are there are some really really good ones, um, and there's some you know everybody comes across occasionally from time to time who who you might think perhaps aren't so good. Um, I think they get a bit of a raw deal because at the end of the day, their job is to look after their client and their player, and that is to get the best deal for them. So there's often talk about it's not good for the game and all that kind of stuff. Actually, that's not their responsibility. I think the frustration, um, certainly, from time to time can be when too many agents start trying to sort of thrust themselves into a deal. Yeah. So a, pl- a club has, has identified a player, talks to one agent about that player, and then another agent says, hold on, you can't talk to him, he's my client. And, and that I think when there's a bun fight as to who is representing that player, that that can be a bit problematic, and and it doesn't help anybody. Has that got worse since there's this idea that you can just sort of pay five hundred pounds and with the FA be, be, be suddenly credited now as an agent? I know that's a relatively recent thing. Has that made that situation more complicated and more difficult? I personally haven't found it. I don't think so. I think um, I think the tr- the trouble is even when it was highly regulated, um, 
there, there are all sorts of things going on in any case. And actually, what the FA has effectively said is, look, try to, we've tried to regulate this, but you know, no one really wants it regulated, and um, we're sort of knocking heads against a brick wall here. So, so they just carry on as you are doing, really. Um, so I, I don't think it's changed that much personally. Do you find, uh, you know, you mentioned before that there's the there's the middle of the road stuff. So just to sort of, you know, do you find the there's the middle of the road deals and then there's the high end deals and then there's the, the lower end deals where clubs might be coming to you because they need an experienced and uh, an intelligent third party head, but they haven't got their own one in house. Is does it tend to be, you know, and again we're all only talking in broad strokes rather than specifics, but is it almost easier with with the bigger clubs, the bigger players, the the cleaner sort of process that, for instance, if you've got a, you know, if, if, if we're talking here about a very, very, very good player, there's less room for, for people to sort of mess about. It's the wishes of that player will be granted. Or can those can those ones be, be as complicated as any others? No, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think the bigger deal, to want a better expression, with the bigger clubs who've done lots of them, have got really sort of professional outfits involved in every aspect, I think are easier. Um, yes, I mean, the biggest problem actually with the lower league stuff is that where a playing contract has been done without the involvement of a lawyer in the past, and there is a, a clause in there which has been drafted by a non-lawyer, and someone's looking to trigger that clause, but actually, you know, sometimes it doesn't yeah. make sense, and actually, frankly, no one really knows what the legal position is, and that's actually where the biggest sort of <laughs> headache comes in that lower league stuff, really. And just, just one last one before we before we let you go back and get on with it, just to sort of put a note in for the listener that we're recording this in mid-June. Is there also becoming more and more established a vibe <clears throat> within sort of elite-level transfers that there's a certain sort of class of club who, at the very top of divisions across Europe, who tend to get their business done first and then that leads to the knock-on effect for everybody else. Have you noticed that trend coming in more and more or is it still just a bit of a free-for-all throughout the whole window? No, I, th- I think you're right, really. I think um, over the years, the experience has told those bigger clubs to get their business done early. And nine times out of ten, when, when there's a rush deal towards the end of a window, um, it, it's often chaos. And I think most clubs now would seek to do their business early, really. Um, and I think all clubs are becoming more and more sophisticated. They know who they want to target. They don't suddenly think at the end of the season, right, who are we going to go after? It's a well thought out process you might as well get on with it earlier than better sorry Ollie one more from me as well um, I, I just wondered about the idea of um, you know you're involved in the process of a transfer uh, a lot of the time and I just wondered what you thought whether you were surprised you know to see headlines and, uh, and reportage around the idea of, of Liverpool tapping up a player because you know from our perspective as, as supporters even just basic things like reading you know ex-players books and that sort of things you know, there seems to be lots and lots and lots of stories about clubs sort of speaking to players, you know, behind the backs of the clubs that they actually play for, if you like. It seems to be a fairly common practice. So um, I just wondered whether you were surprised, because I certainly was, to see the idea of, of, of tapping up appear in the papers when it, it seems to be fairly common practice. Yeah, I think, I think there's two things on that. I think the first is all clubs and all agents are pretty canny as to how they use the media. And... They use it to um, to get certain deals done. It might not even be the deal they're talking about in the paper, getting that done, but it might be you know, the reason to get another deal done. So I think they're all very canny using the media. I think um, it is rare to see tapping up stories in the paper because, uh, you know, glass houses, really. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily a tapping up issue, but I think all clubs operate in a very similar fashion. It's a massive generalisation, but... The industry is the industry, and therefore, the minute you start criticising somebody, you know, if you're not careful, someone could look back and and see what you did a couple of years ago, even. So you have to be a bit careful what you what you claim. Um, that said, you know, I don't know. Often, sometimes it, they may have a valid valid claim. You know, it depends on the circumstances. There you go. Then that's been an Anfield wrap special from us this week. Uh, getting into all all the stuff there about transfers. Let us know what you thought of that one. Really interested to hear your thoughts. Get us on Twitter, on Facebook. Look us up on YouTube as well. We're regularly uh, producing videos now on there. We're on Instagram as well. 
And also, if you've got some time, please do rate and review what we're doing. Uh, it's the best way for us to get the word round about what we're doing, really. So on iTunes, you can give us a rate in there, f- hopefully five stars, hint, hint. Uh, but you can also do a little bit of a write-up about what you think about the show as well. Uh, and, and also on our Facebook page as well, if you look up the Anfield Wrap there, you're able to leave a review there and, and again, a star rating. Um, it'd be great if you could give us a positive review and hopefully more people get onto the Anfield Wrap and we can keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, So we get more from us uh, all the way through the week and the free show will return next Monday.